Man, great to see you. Great to see every one of you. Not most of you, but every one of you. Okay, so um, before we get started today, I want to tell you some more exciting news. Last week, I think I mentioned to you that we hired a worship pastor. We've been searching and searching. Last week, we announced that we found uh, Grant and uh, his wife, uh, Sarah Knoll, who will be with us October 1st. And uh, there's a lot of great information about them. I went over last week, so I'm not going to repeat that. But uh, this week, we want to announce that God, after two years, has brought us a church planter. We've been longing to get a church planted down Dessau, down toward Runberg, kind of that area down there. And uh, God has brought us Reuben and Reem Campos, who have just hired on, and uh, they actually start September 15th. We're way jazzed about this. They're going to lead the charge for the plant down there. And if you're new to Hill Country Bible Church, like we're all about getting the gospel to every man, woman, child, and church planting is one of our key strategies for doing that. So we've planted six churches. This will be our seventh, I believe. And uh, so we're, we're really jazzed. And you'll see that uh, kind of this is the area we're targeting. So here we are up here, about eight or nine miles south is this area that kind of on the north end is, is uh, 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 Palmer. The heart of it is kind of this Breaker and Runberg area, which reaches pretty far east and even west extends a little bit over 35. But this is kind of a, about a three mile radius, I think, three or four mile radius. So this is the area that we're targeting. And uh, Reuben and Reem are going to lead the charge. Reuben is the son of an immigrant from Mexico. And um, his mother was from Cuba. And then uh, Reem is actually from Jordan. And so they're, they're just an incredible couple. Can't wait for you to hear their life story and how God got a hold of them and trained them to get them ready to plant a church. Over the last year, they've been part of one of our sister churches, uh, The Point, down in South Austin, Nick Schock and uh, that team down there. And he's been involved in a church plant internship down there. And, and uh, so we're, we're really excited about them being here. And uh, like I said, they'll be here September 15th. So one of the things I want to just say to you before we begin in the word this morning is, is that God may call you to be part of this plant. And I'd like to ask every one of you if you'd be willing to at least begin praying. And uh, we'll be giving you more information, but I'd like you to pray about what would it look like for you, your family, to relocate to this area to help get the gospel to every man, woman, and child in this area of the city. Um, so that's a big, big decision. And it takes like not just a quick reaction, but it takes like some time to think and pray like what it would be like. Like it'd be great to take uh, maybe some Sunday afternoons and kind of drive this area and pray and evaluate what would it look like to be missionaries to this area of our city. So I can't spend much time on it more than that, even though I'd love to, but um, we'll talk more about it uh, in uh, coming weeks. But I wanted you to hear the good news about um, uh, about Reuben and Reem. So there you go. Father, we now uh, turn our attention to your word. Pray, God, that you would uh, address us, teach us. Holy Spirit, we ask you to give us insight, understanding, courage to apply your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we continue through the book of Ephesians, and we come to the second half of chapter five of Ephesians, which deals with the topic of marriage. And I'd like to uh, begin by showing you one of my favorite Far Side cartoons. And I know you'll have trouble seeing this from in the very back, but it's a picture of, uh, this is Clark and Lois uh, in their later years of life. And the caption says, after many years of marital bliss, tension enters the Kent household. Now you can't see it, but what Lois is doing is stitching the word stupid. <laughs> Uh, under the S, uh, T-U-P-I-D is what she's stitching into it. And, you know, you, like, wow, what happened here? I, that's not good. You know, when, when your wife basically calls you stupid or your husband's really kind of, not, you know, not attentive to you. Now, uh, think about this for a moment. Just indulge me here. Okay, at one point, you know, he was her hero. And she was to him you know, this uh, passionate pursuer of justice and truth, you know, working together there at the Daily Planet. And, uh, you know, he was attracted to her passion for truth and she was attracted to his power to bring about change. And like, you know, it was going to be this, this incredible thing, you know, but somewhere along the way it becomes this. Like he's not overly attentive or affectionate toward her. 
uh, she has lost respect and any admiration for him. I mean, the thing is broken down. Now, it didn't begin this way. So w what happened? Now, you may think, you know, Danny, you're getting a little carried away. It's just a cartoon. You know, Superman's not real. Uh, it's a comic book, you know. But today I want you to think about a model romance that really is no fantasy, it's reality. And it's basically a story of a hero who leaves his home in heaven, enters, uh, 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 you know, the world experiencing this cosmic battle between good and evil. Uh, he daringly comes behind enemy lines, uh, gives his life to uh, rescue uh, who he would call his bride and pursue her with such a passion and a desire to connect that uh, would eventually one day be a picture of a husband's love for his wife and a wife's response to her husband. Like before I read this passage, I want to just preview something that you may have never brought into this passage before. Passage about the role of a husband and the role of a wife. That underneath it, behind it, hovering over it, is this picture of the sacred romance between God and his people. And that it is such a moving story of God's incredible, unpredictable, unconditional, loving pursuit of us. That when you see it, and when you see it clearly where it kind of takes your breath away, and then God turns it and says, you know what? That's what a marriage is supposed to look like. That the way Jesus pursued us is the way a husband would pursue his wife. In the way that we just respond to God because of his love and his grace and who he is, that we just have such admiration for him, that we follow him, that that's the way a wife would relate to her husband. And that is the sacred romance that should color all of our stories of romance. Now, don't take my word for it. Let me read this passage to you, and then we'll try to break this down a little bit. This is chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself, uh, uh, his body and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, uh, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, if you want to have some fun, just make a copy of that and post it right above your water cooler at work and see what the responses are. Certainly, uh, the world around us pushes back at some of the roles that we see described here. But what I want to do is basically get you thinking about two things, just two broad points this morning. The first one, if you're following along in your notes, is this, is that uh, husbands and wives take their cues from Christ and the church. Husbands and wives, when it, when it comes to like, how are we supposed to relate to each other? They take their cues from Christ and the church. Like, you know, they, they, they take instruction from that. That the way Christ relates to the church becomes the model for them. That's what I mean by they take their cues from Christ and the church. So I want you to consider several points of comparison in this passage 
there are several points of comparison, like four or five different times where it says, just as, or in the same way, or relate as Christ is. In other words, several points of comparison. We're just going to try to chart these pretty quick just to make sure we, we get them. And then we'll talk about like how in the world do we apply this, or what does this really look like in real life? So we'll, we'll look at these points of comparison and then ask the question, well, what is the point of the comparison? So that's kind of where we're going here initially. So the points of comparison. First of all, some observations. You may notice that uh, God says some things very directly to the wives and uh, basically spends three and a half verses doing so. And then God will spend uh, eight and a half verses talking to the husbands. Now, on behalf of all the men in the room, I'd like to say that God's got a lot to say to us about our role in this sacred romance or this romance that we find ourselves in. God's got a lot to say about our responsibility. It's not minimizing what God has to say to the wives. But when you look at just the amount of time spent on each, that's important. Another observation I want to make before we get in is that you never in this passage find God telling wives that they ought to love their husbands. Isn't that interesting? Now, husbands are told over and over and over again to love your wives. In fact, you're to love them the same way that Christ loves the church. Now, um, basically, if you extended your search to all of the New Testament, you would never find a woman or a wife commanded to love her husband. Now, in Titus chapter 2, it's hinted at. Older women are instructed to teach younger women how to love their husbands. So, you know, there's, it's not like foreign concept. But what wives are told to do is to basically to uh, uh, respectfully follow their husbands. But husbands are told to love their wives. And we'll explore the significance of that in just a moment. But first, let's walk through these uh, points of comparison. All right, first of all, uh, you know, you're, we're comparing Jesus and the church to husbands and wives. So first of all, we find that Jesus is the head of the church and that husband is the head of his wife. Okay, that jumps out at us in these first three verses. Wives, submit to your own household, your own husbands, as to the Lord. For, here it's the reason, for introduces reason. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as, comparison, Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Okay, the word head just means basically uh, direction. It means authority. That's kind of the idea, like we are under the headship of Jesus. The head of our church is none other than Jesus. Some people would say, well, now, Danny, uh, is this kind of cultural? I mean, haven't we moved beyond this? You know, the idea of wives being submissive to husbands and husbands being leaders of their wives. Is this not kind of a cultural thing? We've outgrown it. Well, the reason why I would say no to that, or one of the reasons, there's many, but one of the reasons is you see that that relationship between a husband and wife is tied to the relationship between Christ and the church. Like the fact that Christ is the head of the church is a universal, it's not cultural, it's not historic, it's a universal uh, a, a principle, a truth for all times, all places. And so the fact that it's tied to that really has the idea of permanence in the same way that Christ is always the head of the church Husbands are to always be head of their wives. Now, that may be wild to you, but let me just mention one other passage. You may write down 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because there Paul addresses again this headship idea, and he makes an interesting statement. He says that the head of Jesus is God. In other words, what, he, what we learn there is that within the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Remember when we studied this uh, uh, a couple of months ago? I, each person of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are equally God, but they have different roles. So the Father sent the Son, and the Son sent the Spirit. So you have different functions, different roles, but equal value, equal worth, all equally God, different functions. That is displayed very clearly in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus prayed 
and speaking to his father, said, Father, is there not any other way that we can do this without me going to the cross? Is there not any way out of this? Now, Jesus, being equally God, could have called myriads of angels to rescue him, but he didn't. He submitted to the role of his father and says, not my will, but your will be done. Equal worth, equal value, but different roles. And that's kind of the idea here is that uh, Jesus uh, is in the, as part of the Godhead, that is the, the father is his head, that in the same way that that is permanent and always true, the headship of the husband over the wife. So this is not a cultural thing. Uh, this is for today. We don't expect outsiders or people that are not believers, they're not followers of Christ. Why would we expect them to agree with that? Uh, we, we don't, and we don't make that an issue about becoming a Christian. The issue with people who don't know Christ is to understand the gospel, that God loves them and sent Jesus to die for them and offers eternal life to them freely uh, for their response of faith. And then as we become followers of Christ, he begins to teach us what life looks like in all these different areas of our life. So, but for us as followers of Christ, this is what he teaches. All right, second point of comparison is that the church submits to Jesus uh, that a wife submits to her husband. In the same way that the church submits to Jesus, a wife submits to her husband. So the word submit is a, a, it's a combina combination word. Hupostaso means the idea of under, and then staso is, is basically to stand or to place. Uh, the word means to be placed under. Okay, so you've got an authority, and I voluntarily choose to place myself under this authority. That's kind of the idea here. I'm not surrendering my identity. Uh, this is no uh, sentence to slavery. This is the idea that I voluntarily, as a wife, would place myself under the authority of my husband. That's what the word submit uh, has in mind. Uh, the word in verse 33, that a wife would respect her husband, has a complementary idea to that. So to submit is to respectfully follow your husband. Uh, the third thing here is that Jesus is the loving leader to the church. And so he goes through a pretty lengthy description of how Jesus gave himself for the church in order to present the church as holy and spotless and blameless. And like all of this uh, description is given in verses 25 to like 28 of what Jesus did in pursuit of us, that he's the loving leader to the church. So husband, uh, likewise, in the same way, it says husband is to be a loving leader to his wife. And finally, the fourth point of comparison is this, is that Jesus loves the church, which is his body. And we've been learning that through the book of Ephesians, that the church is called the body of Christ, Jesus being the head of the church. And so in the same way, husbands are told to love your own body, right? that, G, that, uh, uh, that husbands are to love their wives as their own body. And so like uh, no one like neglects the care for their body in the same way you don't neglect for the care of your wife would be the point of comparison there. So... Um, there's two, the, 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 there's one point to this whole comparison thing. Uh, there, there, there's a point that I want to get to, which is this, that husbands are to be loving leaders. Husbands are to be loving leaders. We'll talk about wives in a moment, but uh, I, I want to just kind of park here for a moment. That gentlemen, when you think about what God did for us, this is what we're to model, okay? If you just kind of too quickly dismiss this as, okay, Jesus died on the cross for the church, so I should be willing to die for my wife. Well, that's a true implication. But it's bigger than that. It's the idea that I give myself completely to my wife for God's very best for her. That I give myself completely to her that she might experience God's very best for her life whatever that is. That's the point. And so when we think about the divine romance, the great big narrative of the Bible, of that God who, after we had rebelled against him, committed high treason, and find ourselves in this broken world, 
when God could have said, well, you made your bed, now lie in it. Instead, he set into motion a rescue plan that moves from chapter three of Genesis all the way through the end of Revelation. And it's a plan that centers around the sending of Jesus as our savior. So even though God like creates us, sets us in this perfect environment, that this enemy is already present. And as the curtains unfold in Genesis, that angel that had rebelled against God, Lucifer himself, has been thrown out of heaven with a third of the angelic host. And he's present when the curtains are drawn back in Genesis. And the man and the woman find themselves in a cosmic battle between good and evil. And the tempter tempts the woman and the man follows in her failure and they rebel and everything goes crazy. But Jesus comes into this environment crosses enemy lines, penetrates to rescue and to redeem us. And gentlemen, that picture of a romantic pursuit of your wife is what God has in mind. In fact, I like what John Eldred says later in his book. He says, uh, who am I really? The answer to that question is found in the answer to another. What is God's heart toward me? Or who, uh, how do I affect him? If God is the pursuer, the ageless romancer, the lover, then there has to be a beloved. The one who is the pursued. This is our role in the story. Earlier in the chapter, it says, therefore, as beloved by God, let us be imitators of God. We are the beloved. God pursued us. And that pursuit, gentlemen, is the model for you toward your wife. Every, every one of our wives are to feel pursued, loved, desired, cared for, committed to. That's what God calls his men to do. It's unbelievable. Earlier, John Eldridge had said, I don't think I shared this with you, but when he talked about the big major story of the Bible, he says the point is the love story. We live in a love story in the midst of war. And sometimes we forget that. We think that marriage is just about our happiness. Is she meeting my needs? Am I meeting her needs? Is he meeting my needs? And those things are important. And marriage, when done well, does produce happiness. But marriage is about something much, much bigger that I hope to convince you of today. There is a transcendent cause to marriage that's bigger than just our happiness. And that is, is that God is doing something in this cosmic battle between good and evil. And that we have a part in that, that is our marriage does. So uh, as we kind of come back to this, I want us to come back to this passage. And um, I, I want us to think about husbands are to be loving leaders. And then the second is that wives are to be respectful followers. We're there to be respectful followers. So they, they follow us. Ultimately, they're following the Lord by taking instruction from him to follow us. Now, uh, men, we understand that's a risky idea for them. And uh, ladies, you don't need me to tell you that. Uh, you feel that. And so that's why, uh, men, when we follow hard after God and, and we spend time in his word and we're, we're, we're prayed up, that our wives find it easier to follow us when, we're, when they see us following the Lord. But ladies, even when our husbands aren't responding that way, that God still calls us to follow Christ by following your, your husband. We're, wives are to be uh, respectful followers. Now, I, I want to spend some time saying, well, what does that really look like? Because it seems like that whole idea comes into play, especially in the area of decision making. When you're faced with big decisions, like what should we do for our kids for school this year? Are we going to do public school? Are we going to do private school? Are we going to do homeschool? Like, what's our, what, what's our philosophy? What, what are we going to do? What happens when, you know, there's a difference of opinion there? Or sometimes it's about uh, some financial investment or some financial purchase that one wants to do and the other thinks it's not a good idea. Like, how do you, how do you resolve that? Or maybe it's the big decisions like relocation or change in career. 
Uh, what, sometimes there are these big decisions. It's not every day. In fact, it's pretty rare. But sometimes there are these big decisions where it seems like a lot is at stake that you, we may struggle. Like, what are we going to do? So what does it look like when you, when you approach those? Well, here, here's a, at least some, some suggestions for you. Number one is this. What does this look like? It looks, first of all, like a romantic dance. It looks like a, a dance. So some of you are into dancing. Some of you aren't. Some of you are, are, are really good dancers. Some of you are not. I'm one of those that are, I'm not a good dancer. But I know this, is that when I take my wife in my arms, I'm supposed to lead... I can't, even, I can't even do it up here by myself, solo. One of us is supposed to lead and the other is supposed to follow, right? And it is in the context of love where one is leading, one's following, because if you both try to follow, it breaks down. You don't move, like nothing happens. If you both try to lead, it doesn't happen. It breaks down. It, it won't work. And that simple analogy is really, in my mind, a profound picture of what God intends. The dance represents the romance, and it represents the recognition that in every relationship like that, it makes sense that someone leads and someone follows. And God, in his wisdom, has directed the man to be the leader and the wife to be the follower. It's like a romantic dance. Equal value, different roles. Not competitive, but complementary. Okay, so second is that it looks like prayerful conversations. So you've got a, a decision in front of you. You've got some area of tension you're trying to work through. That one thing you're going to do is you're going to invest time to talk through it. That husbands, that God never, ever gives you the right as leader to just arbitrarily choose, arbitrarily make decisions on your own and say, well, you know, like it or, you know, like it or leave it. You know, like, I'm sorry. That's, that's never what God has in mind. And so the leader is going to make sure that we're spending enough time talking and praying and seeking God together. And that, you know, husbands, your wife hears you say, oh, Lord, we need your wisdom here. Help us, give us insight in what we should do. And then together, there's this time invested in prayerful conversation. Okay, the third is the idea of appreciation of strengths. So that when you're making decisions that you recognize that in some cases, like, man, the, the husband here is really smart when it comes to finances, understands numbers, has a great a grasp on you know, planning for the future. And so there's like, you, you kind of recognize that. There's, there's appreciation for that. Or the same may be true of the wife in any given marriage. It's amazing in how many marriages that the wife sometimes is gifted in the area of leadership beyond the husband. Like she has the ability to kind of see what needs to happen. And if we're going to reach this goal, what are, what are the things we need to do to get there? And that she's got ability and capability there that a husband will recognize and appreciate and lean into. So the idea of leadership is never lordship. It's never me being solo to make all the decisions by myself. And so I really recognize, first of all, we're going to have open discussion, prayerful discussion, but then I really want to honor the strengths of anyone in the marriage. Uh, the fourth one is just the idea of dependence, that both the husband and the wife are dependent on God in their decision. Now, you know, wives, you may think, man, we're really dependent because if he makes a decision that maybe it's not the decision I would have made, and I've got to trust him. Like, oh man, I've got to be so dependent. Your dependence has got to begin with, with God, that you, you, you depend on him. Your welfare is ultimately in God's hands, so you depend on God as you follow your husband. But let me tell you, husbands as well, who really love their wives and are tempted just to do whatever their wives want to keep them happy, or because they love them so much, that sometimes for a man, the easiest thing to do is just to do what the wife wants. And I would say whenever you can, do that. 
But when God is leading you elsewhere, when God is saying, no, this is what needs to happen, then you've got to depend on God. You say, God, I know that this, is, this may cause some friction or this, this is hard. And God says, just trust me. You've got to trust me. And so it's not just the wives. It's the husbands as well. It's both and who have to be really dependent on God for the decision making here. Now, Kathy and I, we haven't done this perfect. We do pretty well uh, over our 39 years. I think it's 39. It's 39. It's definitely 39. <laughs> if you see her, you tell her I got it right. 39 years. So, um, you know, there are a couple of things that I w- we were texting this morning. And I said, so what are some, what are some decisions that we struggled with? And she wrote me back one and gave me permission to, sh- to share it, so I will. She said, I remember when Jake and Ben were in college, they went to a, a- and uh, <laughs> don't hold it against them, but they, they went to Texas A&M. They were roommates up there. And, and uh, we had a deal where we were good for half the cost and the other half was on them. And so occasionally, you know, Kathy would be in touch with them, calling them and, and getting the feeling like, man, they're really struggling. They're out of money. I mean, they don't have anything to eat. I mean, she, you know, she just had this idea. And she'd say, Danny, uh, is it okay if I send a check to them? And I would say, sweetheart, listen, we can't, they, they, we, we can't be giving them, but this is the deal. And what we want to do is teach them how to manage their resources. They've got to budget and manage. And we can't like just kind of be bailing them out. And so I basically said, no, we're not going to send any money. So um, in one instance, she sent them money anyway. Uh, first hour, uh, Murnell in the front row went, oh, Jesus, like that. <laughs> it was very funny. I said, Murnell, would you like to talk to Kathy about this? Um, Anyway, so she sends the money anyway. And then she felt so bad. A couple of days later, she comes. She's crying, confessing. I know you said don't send me any money, but I sent them money anyway. I know I shouldn't have. And, and so like, we're talking through this. And I just said, well, you know, darling, do you know that Jake just last night took his girlfriend like to some concert in Houston? Like it takes money to do that. So, uh, Lesson learned there. She felt really bad about that. I'll tell you one on me. So Kathy, she's looking to me to, as part of leadership to make sure that we're planning adequately for our future. And so she would say, uh, so how are you feeling? Like, are our plans pretty good for the future? And I would say, yeah, I think so. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, how, why, why would you question me about that? That kind of attitude, you know? And uh, I, I know that's bad. But she would occasionally, you know, bring it up again. How are we doing for the future? What's our plan? I said, well, it's all in motion. It's all in place. And then finally, I said, okay, well, look, let's go sit down with a financial counselor. We sit down, and what we discover is that uh, uh, one of our primary retirement accounts, uh, we'd been uh, socking uh, some money away, but apparently they were waiting for me to give them direction into like what, uh, what kind of investment to direct those funds. They, they've just been gathering and holding in, in an account that wasn't really drawing any interest or anything. And when he explained that to me, unfortunately, Kathy was sitting next to me. <laughs> and there was this moment where my failure here became obvious. And Kathy, was, she was real gracious about all that. But, you know, there's times when we men, we're, we're leading, we think we're leading, we need to be leading, and we fail to lead. Like, that, that's going to happen because we struggle with sin. Like, we, we don't do this perfectly. But l- let's not let that take away from this as God's standard. This is what God calls us to. And so, men, we're growing and loving and leading our wives. And as wives, we're growing in how to respectfully follow our husbands. That's what that God has in mind. Okay, we need to move to the last point, which to me is the most exciting point personally in the passage. And one that I think uh, uh, is often neglected. And that is simply this, is that as we first saw that husbands and wives, uh, we take 
uh, our cues from Christ in the church. But the second is husband and wives give off clues about Christ in the church. Husbands and wives, um, we give off clues. In other words, we model that we become a picture, we become a mirror to other people of how Christ loves his people. That there is this idea of, of a purpose, this transcendent cause behind marriage. Two statements. First of all, marriage is a mystery. Marriage is a mystery. Uh, Paul moves to, in his argument to verse 31 and says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, he's quoting from where there? He's just taking right out of Genesis 2, right? First marriage, that's how it's described. Uh, Adam is told to leave his father and mother, or, or basically that first marriage becomes an, an opportunity to instruct about marriage from then on. That a husband, a, a man shall leave his husband, uh, leave his father and, and his uh, uh, mother and become one. That whole leave and cleave idea. And they become one flesh. That total intimacy, spiritually, physically, emotionally. And then watch what he says. He says, um, this mystery, 32, what he's just described, this oneness, he says, this mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. Now, that's just remarkable. He's saying that this idea of oneness is actually, this, it's a mystery. and It's actually referring to Christ in the church. Now, when it says it's a mystery, it's not a mystery in the sense of unexplainable. It's not like, you know, like, man, how does this really work? It's not a mystery in that sense. Like I think about in Proverbs where the, the writer says, uh, you know, there are three things too wonderful to me, three things that, uh, you know, that are, are, are marvelous to me. This is the way of a ship upon the sea, the way of a serpent upon a rock, and the way of a man with a woman. And it's just like these three things are too marvelous. Now, I think the whole idea of the serpent on the rock is, how does that fit in there? But, you know, you wouldn't want to draw any implications from that about marriage serpent on a rock wow you guys are tough today <laughs> all right so anyway it's not like he's saying this is too marvelous he's, it's not talking about that it's unexplainable instead he's using mystery like he has throughout the entire book that the church was a mystery that those in the old testament nobody could see it nobody foresaw what god was going to do when he created this thing called the church when he was going to heal the hostility between man and God through Christ's blood shed for us, that he was going to heal the hostility between broken people and unite them in a blended family in a new house. Like nobody could see that. And nobody could see that this church would be a reflection of the unique way that God loves his people. Nobody could see that God was going to use something like marriage to be exhibit one for the kind of love God has for us. And that's what he's saying. And so marriage is a mystery, yes, but the mystery is this, is that marriage is a mission. Marriage has a mission, this idea that we are to reflect to other people how we relate to God. Now, listen, this is, this is the idea that people would watch your marriage. Those of you married, uh, God would see you. I mean, people would see you and they would begin saying like, wow, if that's the way God loves people, I, mean, I want to be loved like that. Wow, if, if that's the way this whole Jesus and Jesus followers relationship, if that's the way that looks, man, I want to be part of that. I want to be loved like that. Uh, there's a popular song out, or I guess it's still popular. I, I don't know. It's a country music song, and, and I want the record to show this is the second week in a row that I've quoted a country music song because I think I've told you that I believe country music is the soundtrack of hell. <laughs> uh, apologies to all of you big country music fans, but here's a song by Shenandoah that's basically titled, I Want to Be Loved Like That. 
Maybe you've heard it. Uh, Natalie Wood gave her heart to James Dean, high school rebel and a beauty queen. Standing together in an angry world, one boy fighting for one girl. I want to be loved like that. I want to be loved like that. A promise you can't take back. I want to be loved like that. Daddy never gave mama a diamond ring. Mama never worried for anything. What he gave her came from the heart. <clears throat> a bond that was never torn apart. I want to be loved like that. I want to be loved like that. A promise you can't take back. If you're going to love me, I want to be loved like that. An old man kneeling all alone plants his flowers in a garden of stone. For seven years now, she's been gone and his devotion is still going strong. I want to be loved like that. I want to be loved like that. A promise you can't take back. If you're going to love me, I want to be loved like that. Now, I share that with you because we get that. We get the idea of watching a way a husband and wife relate and thinking to ourselves, wow, I want a marriage like that. I want to be loved like that. But this passage is challenging us to take this one step better. Is that if that's the way God loves me, if that's the way God loves me. I want to be loved like that. And I want to respond to that kind of love. And that's the way we should relate with that mission in mind. The question today is, for everyone watching your marriage, your kids, your in-laws, your friends, what message would they draw from how you relate? Would it cause them to just marvel at God's incredible love for us? I want to ask the worship team to come out of here right now. And as they do, <clears throat> I just want to say that if you're here today and you think about God's, uh, uh, it's the sacred romance of God coming after you, uh, so wanting to connect, uh, risking his own life, giving his own, his own life for you. <clears throat> and if you've never responded to that, if you've said, man, I would love to be loved like that, I just want you to know that your first step would be to just to respond to Jesus and to uh, say in faith something like, Jesus, I, I believe that you died for me. And Lord, I don't, I know I'm not deserving of this. Because I've sinned, Lord. I, I've committed a high treason against you, God. Nevertheless, you've come after me and gave your life. You died for me. While I was a sinner, Christ died for me. And God, I believe that. And I want to be loved by that. Jesus, I want you to be my savior. I want you to come into my life. Forgive me for my sin. And I want to respectfully follow you all the rest of the days of my life. And if that is a decision that you've never made before, you can make that right where you sit in the quietness of your own heart. You can reach out to Jesus who is proposing marriage to you at the moment and say, yes, Lord, I want to respectfully follow you. Amen. I give you my life. I give you my trust. 